The other night I was preaching in a church and I'm, and I'm, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes I get quite a lot of detail and I'm, I'm standing in this church and I, I get a word and, and the name of the lady is Nat, Nat or Natalie, something like that, or Natasha, but Nat. So I'm hearing Nat, I'm seeing an eye that needs to be healed. I see this whole prophetic word and I'm going, right, is there a Natalie in the room? And it's like dead quiet. Because like when you call out a name and you miss, it's just bad, especially when it's a small room. When it's like 500 people, it's like, hey, Johan, okay, there's going to be one, you know. But <laughs> when you have like 20, 30 people, it's quite, in anyway, so I'm going, ah. Oh. But it's so clear, this word, and, and it keeps going. And I'm going, Natalie, Nat, does it make sense to anybody? Everybody goes, no, no, no. So I kind of start joking about it. And I'm like, man, I wish you were here because um, that awesome word for her, right? So keep going, keep going. And it's like, I d but you know sometimes when you feel you shouldn't leave it? Yeah, it's one of those times. Sometimes you shouldn't leave it then. Then don't leave it, right? This is just a story and a tip, by the way. And, um, and suddenly I feel like the Lord says, your angle is wrong. You're, you're starting at the wrong place. I'm going, okay, what do you mean? He says, I showed you the eye first. And I go, okay. So I say, all right. Is there somebody in the room who's got a problem in the right eye, etc., etc.? Lady puts up her hand. I say, do you know a Natalie? She starts crying. She's like, yes, Natalie is the one who caused all my emotional issues in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and then it became this awesome word, right? <laughs> anyway, it's just a story because God is in specifics sometimes. And when, when you feel you have something, don't back down. Even if the door doesn't open, sometimes you just need to kick it open, all right? And just get God's angle on things, right? All right, Isaiah chapter 8. Um, uh, Sunday morning I was preaching in Parl. I still don't know how to say that in English. Parl. It doesn't sound right. Parl. So I was preaching in Parl. And um, Paul. <laughs> anyway, it's a beautiful place. But... Uh, so I was preaching there at the Afrikaans monument, and for some reason my Afrikaans let me down completely. So I just <laughs> switched over to English just to start off in an Afrikaans church, which was fun. <laughs> but uh, as I woke up in the morning, God just gave me Isaiah chapter 8. I just woke up in my spirit with Isaiah 8, because I was kind of joking with my wife. I was just really tired the night before. I said to her, I'm not going to prepare. I refuse. And then I wake up with Isaiah 8. I'm like, oh, now I need to go and read it because I don't know what's in there. <laughs> anyway, so I had to prepare. So, but this passage has just been sitting in my heart since then. And I, I want to just share a little bit on that. I'm going to draw some lines. And then we're going to pray for people if that's okay. So Isaiah chapter 8, there's um, verse 5 and 6 and 7. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, it says, The Lord spoke to me yet again and said, because this people, it was Israel and Judah, have refused and despised the waters of Shiloam. Now, it just explains that Siloam was the only fountain in Jerusalem, right? And it was symbolic of God's protection and sustaining power. So he's speaking to his own people and he's going, because you have rejected these waters that go gently right, and rejoice in and with resin the king of Syria and his son. Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings upon them the waters of the river Euphrates, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all the glory uh, will rise over all its channels, brooks, valleys, and canals, and extend far beyond its banks. All right, that's a bizarre verse, but it really spoke to me. So I want to I start with this thing. So I want to talk a little bit about the pool of Shiloam or Siloam. I don't know what would be Shiloam. I said to my American friend, Shiloam. He's like, Shiloam? I'm like, no. Anyway, so it got weird. So whatever you want to call it, right? The pool. Can we just call it the pool? Right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about this pool because... It's amazing how God speaks to Isaiah and he, you know, kind of he gives him this word and he says, but the issue is you've, you've rejected these waters, right? You've rejected the waters of, of my protection and of my power, right? Protection and sustaining power. And he says, because you've rejected these, I'm going to flood you with the great river Euphrates. Um, and there's a long, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But I want to just 
as I was thinking about this thing, I just see because that, that pool is known for, for healing, right? That's how we know it. John chapter 9, we're going to jump into that in a minute. But it speaks about it's the healing pool, or it was known as the pool of healing um, in, in Jerusalem. But it's also the pool that, that God's people rejected in the story because they went into a completely different direction, not wanting to step into this pool or fountain of life, if you want to call it that, because that's basically what it was, right? It's, I mean, it's a source of life, water, wherever you see water, it's, it's life. I'm, I'm a village boy most of my time, so I know water is necessary, right? Uh, when you don't have a tap where it comes out of, you start appreciating it, appreciating it a little bit more, right? So these guys reject these waters. Israel is not willing to drink from this fountain, but they're kind of looking around at different fountains, different rivers, different sources. And as I was reading it, I felt like God is kind of speaking to us and saying, listen, don't reject the fountain of life. Don't, don't reject the healing waters. Don't reject this place of my power and of my protection. Right? By exchanging it by, looking it, by looking at kings of the earth that look stronger and mightier, something that looks more you know, easier for you to lean into and to protect you in a season of difficulty and challenge. Right? And how I see it kind of prophetically, it's almost this picture where I see where we go and, and there's the fountain of the Lord, but it's not impressive enough, you know, because we're looking for this great river that needs to rush through and run over us. And, and, and we start looking at kings and kingdoms. Kings is anyone in authority, any person of power that you might imagine can help you to break through in the season that you're in besides the Lord. Do you understand? So that, that king can be your pastor, it can be the grace teaching, it can be the prosperity teaching, it can be miracles, it can, whatever, whatever it is, but you're not drinking from the fountain of the Lord, yeah. right? We're looking into different places instead of leaping into what God has for us because maybe it doesn't look impressive at the moment or in the season, right? Because a fountain versus a river, the river does look a little bit more impressive, especially the great river Euphrates. And so often we get sucked into these streams, into this way of life, of thinking, of doing things, and we look in so many different places, but it's like we, we, we stay out of the simplicity of the gospel where the power and the sustenance really is. Right? It's so simple to run to the gospel. It's so simple to run to Jesus. It's so simple to run to the river of life. Okay? But yet... Sometimes we lose track and, and the Assyrians look very impressive right now or whatever that might be, whatever that, that thing is that's pulling on your life, that's pulling you in a different direction. And I believe that God's kind of just going, calling us back to the simplicity of just getting into a living relationship where we drink from the fountain of life, who is Jesus Christ himself. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 7, come at the end of the feast. Remember, it's, it's an awesome feast. People are... None of my words seem right right now. <laughs> Fed up, right? They, they've eaten, they feasted, right? They're not thirsty anymore yeah. for whatever reason. And Jesus goes on the last day, he says, come, if you're thirsty, come to me. Remember John chapter 7, verse 37? He says, if you take a drink of me, what will happen? Rivers of living water will flow from your inside. Am I right? There's this picture, if you look at the book of Genesis... Um, Genesis chapter 2, where, where you see where man is created, Adam, where Adam is created. He comes out of the dust. God breathes into him. You know the whole story. And then, and then Scripture says that Adam was placed in a garden in Eden, right? Okay? So he was placed in a garden in Eden. But out of that garden, there were four rivers, Remember? These four, the Euphrates was one of them, by the way. It doesn't matter what their names are. I have them, but it doesn't really matter, right? So these four rivers were flowing out of the garden, and it watered the earth. It was one river that turned into four, right? So it started with one river, then it broke into four, watered the earth, okay? I want, I want you to see this picture real quick with the fountain picture. The point was it was one river that turned into four, Right? Um, Jesus says, come and have a sip of me and there will be rivers of living water flowing from your inside. God is 
making this accusation against the people saying, listen, you're not drinking from the pool, the fountain of life. You, you've refused to take a sip out of the living water so that there can be rivers that flows out of you onto the earth. Am I right? Th the point is this, that, that the garden speaks of your place of intimacy with the Lord. Do you understand? The garden wasn't the place where dominion was exercised. It was the place where union was practiced. Do you understand? That's the place where God met with Adam in the cool of the day, which is not a time, it's an age, it's a, it's a lifestyle of walking in the Spirit. Right? So the garden is the place that you keep and God meets with you. And out of this garden flows rivers onto the earth. Does it make sense? Right? Okay. What I want you to see is, is I want you to see this picture. We, when we reject the waters of, Sh of Shiluam, I believe our garden gets messed up. And when our garden is messed up, communion or union with the Lord is broken. And suddenly the flow out of our life onto the earth is not good. It's not pure anymore. It's not r rivers of living water bursting from your inside. Do, do you see the picture here? It was, it was always to do with where, what is your source, where are you drinking from, because you have to release something onto the earth out of this garden. Come and drink from me, rivers of living water will flow from you. Why rivers? Because it's a picture of Genesis 2 again. Do you see that? And I believe the minute that we start rejecting the fountain of our healing, right? The minute that we start rejecting the simplicity of the gospel, our garden suffers. And it's not a welcome habitat for the Lord to walk in. So suddenly there's a river flowing out of it, but it's not the river of God. It's not rivers of living water. It can be a river of bitterness, a river of offense, a river of unforgiveness, a river of anger, a river of lust, a river of whatever. Do you understand? And suddenly you're watering the earth out of the garden of your heart, but it's horrible water that's flowing from it because you've rejected the waters of healing. Right? It's like Jonah. Jonah has become one of my favorite stories of late in the Bible again. I don't know when was the last time you read Jonah, but he's probably the funniest guy in the Bible, I think. <laughs> I think. To me personally. If ever I was reading, I just started laughing in bed. I said, you need to see this. I just called my wife. She said, Look at this guy. He's funny. Right? He's so angry. Have you seen? He's an angry dude. He's funny. Right? I mean, he... he it's the biggest revival in the Bible, basically, right? 120,000 people come to the Lord in a, I don't know, 30-second preaching. I don't know, what was that? Like, you need to turn, otherwise God's going to get you. I'm like, okay, we'll repent, <laughs> right? Whole city saved, 120,000 people with one line, right? I mean, that's not hard to prepare for that, right? <laughs> it's just, you just go in there. I mean, he's so angry. Then chapter 4 comes. I love chapter 4. And then he goes, <laughs> and he's just like, God... I told you this is what's going to happen. I said, I knew you were merciful and kind, slow to anger and rich in love. I knew you are going to have mercy on them. <laughs> That's why I did not want to go. You know, he's like this bitter little dude, right? He's so angry, right? And then he goes, verse 2, and he's like, I just want to die, <laughs> right? I think God just kept him alive because he was so miserable. He's like, I'm not saving you out of this. I'm leaving you in your thing. And then, and then Jonah 4, verse 4, this is my favorite verse. It's where God responds, and I, I can just see the Lord do this, right? And God looks at him, and he, and he goes like, Jonah, does it do you well to be this angry, right? Can you imagine that? Anyway, that verse started to strike a nerve in my heart, right? And I see God standing in front of us going, does it do you well to be so angry? Does it do you well to be so bitter? Does it do you well to be so offended? Does it do you well to be so disappointed? Right? I, 
I see God standing in front of his body and looking at each and every one of us, including me, and going, does it do you well? You know, how's this working for you? Because that's the issue, right? The minute we step into this place where, where we lose perspective of the source and what we need, and we run to Syria and to all other things to get our comfort, our healing, our forgiveness, we're not getting healing, we're just putting a band-aid on something, and there's no real deep healing in our hearts, and our garden is messed up, Right? Our garden is in a bad state. And the issue is the flow out of our lives becomes muddy and useless. We're not being a solution, but we're being a problem. We're adding to the difficulty of the world. We're not adding to being a solution into society because this garden is a mess. We're not drinking the waters of Shiloh. We're, we're not stepping into that place. And we, we justify ourselves and our behaviors by surrounding ourselves with people that say, ah, it's okay, I understand, you're going through a really hard time. Right? Does it do you well to be in the state that you're in? Does it do you well to reject Scripture because you try to justify hurt in your own life? Because that's what we do. We don't want to admit it, but let's just be really honest for a minute with each other. We're so offended, we're so angry that we cannot forgive. Yet God says, you need to forgive. But you go, yeah, but you don't understand. It really hurt. Like, yeah, I know. For some reason, that doesn't look like Jesus cares. It, he, he just wants you healed. Does it do you well to believe what you believe? Does it do you well to justify your behavior in the season? And yet you're not getting breakthrough in your life. You're sitting in the same place season after season, year after year. Does it do you well? We're angry. We're bitter. Offended. Oh, man, we're so offended. My goodness. Whew. It's rough. You know, about the strangest things sometimes. But we are offended. Yet we refuse the waters of Shiloam. There is healing right in front of us. We just need to drink from that fountain, but we don't want to. Or we somehow can't because we don't have vision. We, we, we can't even see that we're wrong anymore. Then you've got a big problem. If you're, as a believer, I'm talking to believers, I'm not talking to unbelievers tonight, right? If you, as a believer, are acting 100% opposed to Scripture, and you can't, you can't even see that, you understand that you've got a problem. That's called a stronghold, by the way. It's a stronghold. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1 to 5, where Paul speaks, we're going to break down these strongholds. How is a stronghold formed? By lofty opinions and knowledge that go, and, and information that goes against the knowledge of God. Opinions and arguments. Just listen to this for a minute. Opinions. Can I say that word again? Deafening silence. Opinions. <laughs> opinions, right? And arguments. That goes against the what? The knowledge of God. And what does that do? It creates a stronghold. It's not a demon. But it's a nice home for a demon. Very nice home. They like coming there and making a little home for themselves. And they hide there because it's a stronghold. And the problem with a stronghold is that you cannot see the truth. Because you're looking at life through this thing and your garden is messed up. <laughs> and God goes, does it do you well to be in this state? Because the frightening thing about this stuff is that if you don't deal with it, Scripture is pretty clear. God says, if you, don't, if you don't forgive, if you don't let go of your bitterness and your offense, then what happens? He gives you over to the torturers. All right? I want you to think about this stuff. This doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. This was Jesus' parable I'm going to lie if I tell you where it is, but I think it's Matthew 17 or 18, so you can go and check it out. 
But it's in the Bible. <laughs> right? The point is you're given over to the torturers. What does that mean? Your life is full of torment. I'm not talking about sickness and disease. I'm talking about you don't have peace. Your thoughts, your, what's going on in your mind is tormenting you because he's given you over to your own desire and the fact that you don't want to forgive. You don't want to set people free. You don't want to let go. You don't want these strongholds to break down. So your garden is an absolute disaster, right? He's trying to speak to you, but you're not hearing. But the waters of Shiloh is right there. You just need to step in, right? But the Euphrates looks better right now because the banks is flooded. <laughs> That's why Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs forth the issues of life. It's the same idea. You need to watch this thing called your soul dimension because otherwise you're just like Jonah, right? Bitter and angry. <laughs> These things need to break down. They have to break down. Because it's withholding you from your destiny. It's, it's blinding you, right? It's literally blinding you. Like you cannot see the difference between right and wrong anymore. Your discernment is gone. Your, your ability to see righteousness from unrighteousness goes because this thing is filtering everything in your mind and you've stepped out of the protection and the sustaining power of God. What does that mean? You're vulnerable. You're, you're vulnerable. Right? You're not in the safe place. Because there's another stronghold, Zechariah 9, and it's called the stronghold of the Lord. That's where you want to be. That's where truth is surrounding you. The truth of the Word of God, the knowledge of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. Where that forms you, that's your identity, it's the truth that you stand in. And out of that springs forth rivers of living water. And suddenly you're feeding the earth you're feeding your community, you're feeding your family with the word of the Lord and the living waters of God from the pool of Shiloam. It's a difference. And it's important, right? Because our families are looking, our society is looking for the real thing, but they're looking at Christians and they're going, you're a sad bunch. <laughs> you know? And we can't be a sad bunch. And I'm not, I'm not being condemning. It's, it's none of that. It's just, it's real. It's, it's a battle. And it's so real. It's so necessary that we kind of look at this stuff and, and look at our own lives and go, man, how am I doing? If there's patterns in your life that keep repeating, it's probably a stronghold. Over and over, the same cycle, just, it's, it's probably a stronghold. There's probably something that you're believing that's absolutely against the knowledge of God. And your identity is shaped around this thing it's not even who you are. It's not even who you are, but you believe that this is who you are. It's a problem. Right? It's stealing from your destiny. It's taking from you. If you just look at the political world, listen to them talk. It's strongholds. They can't even hear each other. Have you walked into a room where people are talking and it's like, oh, <laughs> are you listening to the same conversation that I am? Because it's like you and you are, but it's like no one is hearing. It's like, wh what, what is happening here? Have you had that? If you're married, I'm sure you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? But I'm talking serious. Like, like there's truth and then there's, I don't know what this is, but it doesn't matter how much truth. It's like you can't even hear what somebody else is saying. That's a stronghold. It's like you're just, I don't know, you're deaf. You can't hear unless it's through your filter. Right? If that is your experience in life, you've got a stronghold. And that thing needs to break. You need to get back to the waters of Shiloh. Your garden is a mess. I'm saying that politely. <laughs> Is it doing you well? <laughs> Does it do you well? 
<laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? Does it do you well? You need to look at this stuff. Look at the cycles in your life. Look at the patterns in your life. Some of us, we all go for deliverance. That would have been easy. Sometimes it's not. It's truth. Yeah. The lack of truth. Lack of truth. Oh, yeah, it went for counseling. It went well for about a day. And he had a backslide again. It's like, oh, the demons. No, it's, it's a stronghold. Your thinking is wrong. There's no sustainability in it because truth is not the undergirding thing that, that carries this. Your identity is formed out of a lie. Right? And you break it down through righteousness and obedience. That's what that scripture says. Obedience to the truth. Right? Obedience to the truth breaks down the stronghold. So there's no quick fix. That's the problem with strongholds. We want a th quick thing. There is no quick thing. It's not quick. It's slow. It's drinking from that pool of life. It's drinking. And then drinking some more. And then the lie comes. And it's not true. Let's drink from truth. And you keep breaking down the lie by the truth. Because this thing will destroy your marriage. It will destroy every relationship in your life. That's what it does. It even destroys your relationship with God. Does it do you well? Because it, it builds around you and it's this wall that sits around you and it just keeps everything out. And you create this own little world inside here. It's an internal reality that forms that's absolutely out of line with the Word. And when it's out of line with the world, chaos will follow. Right? So this thing is pretty... I didn't think I'm going to go there that strongly. I just want to add that. But this thing is pretty important because too many people are stuck in a place where we're not seeing what God wants us to see. We're not seeing. We're, we're not getting traction in life. We're like, you know, st stuck in the mud. Remember that game? Stuck in the mud. And that's not the way of God. It's not. God's way is a highway of holiness, Isaiah 35, and no beast of the field will be on it. That's God's way. There's progression in the Lord. There's forward motion in the Lord. And John 9, I'm just going to read it. I'm just going to tell you about it. You know the story where the, the, the young man um, born blind, remember that story? Where Jesus and the disciples crosses him. They have this great argument about whether it's because of his sin or his parents' sin. And Jesus is just like, doesn't matter. I'm going to heal him anyway. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> And uh, then Jesus goes and he spits on the, f on, on the ground, makes mud, remember? Puts it on his eyes, remember? And then Jesus says to him, go and wash yourself in the pool of Shiloam, right? And you will see. Okay? Can you see the picture? Right? We've stopped drinking from the right pool. We've got the stronghold in our life. You can't see a thing. Can't see a thing. And then Jesus goes, listen, would you go and wash yourself in the pool of Shiloam? Just go. Yeah. Right? Because what does it do? Strongholds, messed up garden, whatever you want to call it, it withholds you from having vision. You don't have vision. If you don't have vision, you have a problem. Right? Right? You don't have a vision for your life. If you don't feel like you, and I'm not, I'm not talking about specifics, of course, but just you wake up with a reason to live. That's vision. You just you wake up and I, I feel like I mean something to the world, and it's because I know that I am a son of God, I'm a child of God, I have purpose, I have destiny. That's who I am, and I'm going to do something today for the Lord. And I'm happy to do it. Even if it's nothing, then I'm still going to do it. Yeah. Right? And I'm going to enjoy it because it's unto the Lord. Right? Whatever you do, it, do it as if unto the Lord. Right? That's a verse. It's a verse. It's either true or it's not. Yeah. doesn't matter what season you're in, what you're doing in this season, it's unto the Lord. As if unto the Lord. Right? If you're doing nothing in this season, then do the nothing as if unto the Lord. Don't moan and groan about it because it's unto the Lord. 
right? We, we have to shift into this reality because th these giants of the faith believed that it was unto the Lord. I'm doing this unto the Lord. I'm parenting unto the Lord. I'm doing marriage unto the Lord. I'm doing relationship unto the Lord. I'm doing business unto the Lord. Because that's what he says, right? It's unto the Lord. So this, the minute that I start drinking from a different pool, I go spiritually blind and I'm not seeing anymore because these walls are building up around my life and I'm struggling to have vision. All I see is myself. That's a problem. That's the problem with Jonah, right? Just kill me. <laughs> I knew you're merciful. I knew you're awesome. That's why I didn't want to go. So just kill me. <laughs> Does it do you well, Jonah? <laughs> Does it do you well? Man. Does it do you well to compromise? Yeah. Does it? Does it do you well to be disobedient? Does it do you well to live in fear? It's a serious question. And it blinds us. So this blind guy goes, and, and we all know the story. He washes his eyes in the pool of Shiloam, and what happens? He sees. Suddenly he goes, for the first time in my life, I'm seeing. Right? And that's the famous verse. We all know it. Um, I was blind, but now I see. Why? He had an encounter with the Lord. And he went to the pool of healing. He went to that place. Right? The other thing that I wanted to... So I want you to close your eyes for a minute before I go into the other thing. Just close your eyes. If, if God is standing right in front of you now, what is the question He's asking you? Does it do you well to be what? If you don't hear a thing, awesome, just relax. Man. But if you do hear something, I want you to respond to that now. I just said, Lord, it's not doing me well. Maybe you didn't even see it. Maybe you can't see it now because you're still blind. That's okay. Then I want you to pray this prayer in your heart. Just say, God, let's all pray together. Would you mind? Just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, help me. If there's any stronghold in my life, would you come and show me? Holy Spirit, please reveal the truth to me now. If he showed you something, you're going to have to start working on that thing. If it's anger, then why are you angry? If it's, it's bitterness, why? Why are you bitter? If it's unforgiveness, offense, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, why? If it's passivity, why? What is holding you? Because there's something behind it. And that something needs to be dealt with. Because it's going to destroy your destiny. It's making you blind. And we don't want blind people walking out of here tonight. We don't want blind, we want to be blind people in a month from now. Do you understand? We want to be free. We want to progress in the Lord. And if there's an excuse in your heart about, ah, oh, this is just my personality, that's the lie. Your personality is no excuse to be ungodly at all. As, you know, somebody one day said to me, yeah, but um, I'm, w it's just my personality. I'm, I'm not somebody that can, I can't live with unrighteousness, so I just, I have to tell everything that I know. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, that's gossip and slander. It's got nothing to do with your personality. That means you have no love, otherwise you would have covered. 
And then you would speak to the person. Not about the person. Big, that is nothing to do with your personality type, right? That is the biggest cover-up I've heard in years. Don't fall for that stuff. No, but my personality is I'm a very feisty individual, right? I agree, so was Peter. But somehow the same rules apply to him, right? There's, there isn't an excuse in your personality type. Don't hide behind that stuff. It's not true. We have to change. For some, it's easier in certain areas. For some, it's more peace. For some, is more, yeah, I get all of that. I, I understand. But you still we have the same word that speaks to all of us. Am I right? No excuse. Yeah, but my background. Sorry. I'm not saying there's not grace, but there's no exemption in the Bible because you come from this or that background. We need to work on it. Doesn't mean there's not grace, but we have to work on it. Do you agree? We have to drink from the healing waters. We have to wash our blindness in the waters of healing. How do you do that? You get into the Word. You spend time with God. You have a garden that's healthy. And you commune with Him. And you get the weed out of it. Right? You clean that thing up so that God actually wants to be there. He'll come into any place. But you understand I'm talking to believers now. I'm talking to believers. I'm trying to give you just a visual of what it should be. Is that place well tended? That place of intimacy? That place of being with the Lord? It's important. And if you discovered something tonight, I, you need to start working on this thing by opposing it with truth. Find the truth in the Scriptures. If you're angry because you feel that somebody, you know, I don't know, abused you in some sense or way, or that it's unfair what's happening to you, then get truth about that. Get the truth about it. It might be that in this world somebody did something, but what does God say about it? What are we supposed to do? Didn't he say something like, hand them over to him? Because he's the judge. And he will judge righteously and justly. Yeah, but you don't understand. No, no, no. I don't care. He doesn't understand. Seems like it. <laughs> Offended. Yeah, but you don't know what they did. Uh, I didn't say it's going to be easy. I just said it's truth. Right? It's about the truth. There's healing available. You just need to go for it. You know what's the other amazing thing about the pool of Shiloam? This is actually what I want to... I wanted to get into this a little bit more. Right? But Shiloam actually means saint. Saint. So... Another guy writes about it and it says it's the apostolic pool. Now that is interesting. When I discovered that that morning, I thought, well, now we're talking. <laughs> that is pretty interesting. This is what I want to propose to you, and it kind of confirms what I've started out with, is that what is the apostolic about? And it's not about an apostle. It's not, I'm talking office. I'm talking spirit of the apostolic or the apostolic grace that's made available the apostolic, it's about a commissioning and a sending out of people, right? It's about a, a thrusting people into their destiny and into their callings, right? And what I see in this thing when I, when I read it, it, it's just amazing to me, but it's almost like there's something about discovering your calling or your apostolic mandate from the Lord that actually opens your eyes. So it's like the minute that you connect with what God has destined you to do, that suddenly you start seeing. Where a lot of people are waiting to see before they move. God actually says, no, start moving and then I will let you see. Yeah. Do you hear? There's a big difference in this thing. So there's an apostolic thrust that's almost coming through this piece of Scripture. So it's all of the stuff I mentioned and this part that really gets me excited. Because it's... My people perish due to a lack of vision, right, and knowledge. There's, there's that thing in Proverbs where, where there's no prophetic vision, my people perish. This is something like that, Proverbs 29, sorry. Bad quoting, all right? What is the point of this? Is where, where, when I'm not seeing where I'm going, I, I don't go. <laughs> and I get stuck. 
and I don't want to drink from these waters, right? But as I drink from the waters of Shiloh, which is actually my healing, there's also an apostolic thing that starts being birthed inside of me so that we go out and we make a difference. And in the doing, the healing comes. Not one of the disciples or the 12 apostles that Jesus called were fixed perfect when he called them. Do you agree? Right? They were all a mess. But they walked it out with him, and as they walked, they started seeing, and they went, ah, I'm discovering who I'm supposed to be. Do you see that? Destiny was opened up. Why? Because they walked with God. Their garden was perfect, if you want to mention it like that, by His grace, because He forced Himself (laughs) on them in a nice way. When they said yes, He just said, well, I'm not leaving you. You're going to be next to me for the next three and a half years, which is awesome, Right? So they kept seeing this. They kept walking, communing with the Lord. And as they did, their eyes started going open. And they started seeing this thing from a bunch of guys who thought about who is the most important to the kingdom to all of them being willing to die a martyr's death in the end because of their love for the Lord. Right? From Thomas, who was called Doubting Thomas, which I still don't really believe, to Thomas, who went the farthest of all of them. Right? He took the gospel to India. Nobody went a longer way from home than he did. Why? Because they walked with the Lord and in the walking and in the sending out, suddenly their eyes are opening up and they're getting this thing and their sight is being restored. And they go, I once was blind, but now I see, right? And they're doing something with their lives. There's vision. So it's healing on the one hand, but it's also this mandate to be sent on the other hand, right? And I believe this season is about... (coughs) Yes, I will say it. Deuteronomy 23, I think. Let me just get it, man. I'm quick. <laughs> yeah. I was preaching in the church the other day, and I, and I felt this is a prophetic word, so I'm just going to give it to you in any way, right? Deuteronomy 23, verse 13 and 14. Just listen to this. And I'm not trying to be funny or smart with you. I'm serious. It's a tool that God gives us that's really important. It's called the shovel, Right? And it says, and you shall have a shovel among your weapons. And when you sit down outside, the Amplified helps us to relieve yourself. You shall dig a hole with it and turn back and cover up what has come from you. Okay. So you get the picture, right? Uh, we, uh, we need shovels, all of us. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be funny, <laughs> but it's very visual. The point is this, that we've got stuff that needs to be covered up, and we need to be able to move on. Because our garden is a mess. We're, we're not... Because we're stuck in a place where we shouldn't be. And what happens is we're walking around each other's maze, to be quite honest, and everybody's getting stinky and we're not moving where we're supposed to move. Because what's the next verse? This is what I want you to hear. And I'm, I read this a couple of months ago and this thing just knocked me out. And it says, For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp. To deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Do you hear me? Listen, guys, God is so on to us. God wants to walk among us. But there's rubbish everywhere opinions, offense, anger. It's all over the place. And God wants to walk among us. And can you imagine the stench of sin to a God who is as holy as He is? And then it goes, therefore shall your camp be holy. Does it do you well? No. What does? Holiness. Therefore shall your camp be holy. That he may see nothing indecent among you and turn away from you. Isn't that a picture? It's a vivid picture, but I want you to see it. It's like God says, listen, can you clean up your mess? I'm going to help you. But clean this thing up. 
because I'm walking in the midst of you. He's listening. Some of us disqualify ourselves from hell by our own words. We disqualify ourselves from breakthrough because of what we speak and release over our situations. God is amongst us. God walks among us. It's awesome news that He's among us. But it should also make you think twice. God walks among us. He's among us. What is flowing out of the river of your heart? Because He's hearing it. And if this thing is not healed, then we have a problem. Because He wants to fight your enemies. He wants to step into battle for you. And some of us just need to get a shovel. <laughs> it's the year of the shovel. 2019 is going to be my new... <laughs> <laughs> right but God wants to do something in our lives he wants to commission you he does there's an apostolic thrust that he wants to release in this house I believe it with all my heart in South Africa with all my heart I had a maybe I'll share on that but I had an encounter a couple of years ago where he spoke to me about a new apostolic and prophetic breed that he's releasing in South Africa it's going to shake the nation. It's going to shake our nation. It will never be the same again. Right? So in this apostolic thing, there's also vision being restored. But it begins with get to the pool of healing. Even when you're blind. The boy was still blind. He was blind when he walked to the pool. He couldn't see, but he knew. The Lord said, get to the pool. It's like, okay, I'm going to get there. It's like God is saying to some of you, get to this place, get to that place, get into Scripture, get with me. You're not seeing it. You don't have to see. You just need to obey right now because that's how you break down the stronghold. It's the obedience thing. And in the obedience, suddenly this apostolic thing is released in your life. And when your eyes are open, you don't only see, but you start running with purpose. That's what he wants to give us. But he says, clean up the mess, Right? We need to clean up the mess. We need to get into this place. Because why? Isaiah 8, 18. That these children will be what? A sign and a wonder to the world around you. You're supposed to be a sign and a wonder to all of creation around you. Every single one of us, you're supposed to be a sign and a wonder. People are supposed to look at your life and go, you don't make sense. And then you go, thank you very much. <laughs> Jesus is with me, right? <laughs> the apostles were signs and wonders. Remember? In Acts, I think chapter 17, and I looked at them and said, what's wrong? They're not educated. What's wrong with them? Yet they are turning the world upside down with their preaching. Yeah. They were a sign and a wonder. And all they could say was, but they hung out with Jesus. <laughs> Seems like their garden was okay. Seems like they kept that thing. They kept their hearts pure. They, they were doing what's right. The basics of Christianity, like forgive other people. Don't gossip. Don't lie. Right? Believe the truth. Guard your heart. Basics of Christianity. It's not lofty stuff. This is simple. Yet we fail. Right? We struggle. They have to look at you and you have to be that sign and wonder. They have to look at your marriage, your children. They have to look at every area of your life and go, this is bizarre. How is this working? Right? I don't understand how this thing is coming together. If I have to be looking at you and go, man, I'm in awe of God when I look at your life. Your life is speaking to me without you doing a thing. That's what you're supposed to be, right? People have to come to you and say, how do you do it? Then you're on the right track. Why are you so happy? Why do you have hope? Right? Not why are you so bitter. <laughs> That's not a sign and a wonder. <laughs> right? That's not a sign and a wonder. We need to go the other way. And here's the awesomeness about it. That pool is open wide and you can drink. You can drink. It's not hard, this thing. Just run to the pool. I know you're blind. I know you don't feel it. doesn't matter. You just go there. And what will happen? The scales will come off. And you're going to see. And purpose will be released. 